Hello world. I'm trying a little bit of a different setup here today. I don't know if this is going to work too well. Maybe it will, maybe it won't. We'll see. I'm just kind of experimenting, but I wanted to do a quick picks of the week because I've been watching movies and listening to music, of course, and just wanted to talk about a couple of things that were sticking in my brain this week. Uh, I'm going to start with an album that came out a while ago. Well, originally it came out quite a long time ago, but uh, was re-released a while ago, and I just now managed to get a copy of it. The remastered version of The Cure's Wish. So, I think this is a hugely underrated album by The Cure. Uh, 1992, this came out. And, um, you know, the big, the big hits that everybody probably knows off here are Friday I'm In Love, of course. And maybe High, I guess. That's the other one that's kind of popular. Um, but like most great Cure albums, Wish is incredibly funny and dark and, um, even when they're creating songs that sound upbeat and happy, there's some sort of level of insanity there that's just kind of absurd and over the top. Uh, one of the best examples of that on this album would be doing the unstuck, which is a song that sounds very, very happy and very upbeat and poppy, but the lyrics are about burning down your house and burning down the neighborhood and throwing everything away and starting over and all that sort of thing. So um, it's almost kind of, again, absurd in its um, happiness. There's like this really insane, insane sort of um, tone to everything where it's like he's Robert Smith has just kind of lost his grip on reality and he's just like smiling like a lunatic and talking about burning down the house. I mean, it really strikes me um, that way, but it's a great song. Uh, this album, I love the the opener and the closer on this album. There's one called Open and one called Close. And so these songs um, are really great sort of bookends to this album because they kind of talk about the whole experience here. And um, Open is a song that's about Robert Smith, presumably, um, kind of being carted around and being sort of a dancing monkey and having to go to public events and talk to people and make small talk and whatever. And it's just the whole thing is he continues to drink and drink and drink the whole time because he's just trying to escape in some way. And, you know, the, the lyrics, again, get very sort of disturbing and dark. Things like, I've got blood on my hands, I've got hands in my brain. I mean, Robert Smith has always struck me as a very sort of philosophical writer. Um, you know, I mean, obviously he's well read, he's referenced Camus and a lot of existentialist and philosophical theories and sort of things in his lyrics throughout the years, most notably with, you know, Camus is killing an Arab, which is basically a retelling of the stranger. Um, but you know, in general, a lot of his themes and a lot of his lyrics deal with this sort of odd existential dread that you just can't necessarily name but it's there and it's all encompassing and it is hard to work through. Um, but he does this through the medium of pop songs. He talks about things like this. And you know, the, the funny thing about The Cure is that, you know, I'm a Gen Xer. I grew up in the, the 80s and the 90s and you would think that I loved The Cure from the very beginning of my life, but that is not true because the only sort of exposure I'd had to The Cure was through the radio and MTV. And the few songs that I had heard were like, love song and Friday I'm in love and things like that always I always just kind of took them at face value and thought oh these are very poppy sort of disposable cheesy songs but they've got this goth vibe going on just wasn't for me you know I was into like industrial and punk and um you know gangster rap at the time I mean it was like I needed a harder edge right and when you didn't listen to the when you didn't listen to the full album and you just kind of took those singles out and divorced them from the context of the whole here uh, it, it gave quite a different impression of The Cure to me, and I just never really got into them until, uh, I want to say it was 1992, maybe, when the, the Crow came out, the movie The Crow, and the Crow soundtrack, and it was a great soundtrack, but opening track on there was a Cure song. I, I fell in love with that song. I thought it was amazing, and that is what made me dive into The Cure's catalog. Started at the very beginning, went all the way through to, you know, contemporary times, which at the time, I want to say, was this album. Um, so, um, you know, this, this kind of is nostalgic for me in a way because it was kind of 
when I was really getting to the cure, this was their newest album at the time. And so I, you know, of course, gravitated toward listening to it. Um, people always say, you know, disintegration to quote South Park is the greatest album ever made. And there's a good argument for that. <laughs> the cure made a lot of great albums. Disintegration is absolutely a wonderful, brilliant album. Um, it's kind of hard to talk about disintegration because when I really got into that album, I was in a weird space in my life and there's a lot of <laughs> things going on. So it's a soundtrack to part of my life. I don't necessarily want to remember very well, uh, but undoubtedly it's a great album, but for one reason or another, I always like to come back to wish. I just think it's very well-rounded in their catalog. You've got stuff that's very sort of, um, slow and depressing, like apart or trust. You've got the poppy bangers like Fred Am and Love and High. You've got the weird rock sort of existential drama writ large with like open and close um, or open and end. Um, and then, you know, you've also got one of the hardest songs they've probably ever written on this album is called Cut. Um, and it just goes super hard. It's super aggressive uh, for The Cure. And... All in all, I think it's just a great album. This is a great remaster. Uh, they were doing a whole series of remasters and they stopped right before they were going to put Wish out a long, long time ago. I mean, this was years and years and years ago. I remember buying all those deluxe editions that they were putting out. Um, and then they just, some for some reason, stopped. So it took a really long time for this remaster to come out. I had only had the CD version of this originally. And I'll tell you this, that CD master is total dog shit. The one thing that always drove me crazy about listening to that album is just the mastering and the production on whatever the CD master was that they put out because it was just so muffled and so low and so there was no dynamics to it at all. Um, it was always really depressing to hear that album with songs that were so bombastic in a lot of ways um, in such a weird, muddy uh, way. So I'm really glad to have this on vinyl remastered. Um, you know, there's digital files out there too that are remastered there's a cd that's remastered so whatever your preferred format is go out and buy wish it's a great album uh great album for the cure great album for people to start with for the cure too because it again it it showcases pretty much every side of them it's got the dark stuff it's got the fun stuff it's got the funny stuff it's got the absurd stuff it's got the rock stuff uh it's just all around grade a cure check it out all right, now I'm going to talk about a couple of movies that I got this week. All these films I've seen before, all these films I love, there's no blind buys in here, but um, just couldn't pass them out because they're all 4K uh, UHD Blu-rays. So to start off, I'm going to go chronologically here and we'll start with Devil Indemnity. God damn, I love this movie. I love Billy Wilder. I know I've talked about Billy Wilder before on my 10 favorite films list. Uh, I chose Sunset Boulevard as one of my favorite films. I go back and forth. I always have my entire life between thinking Double Indemnity or Sunset Boulevard is my favorite Billy Wilder movie. I don't really know. I mean, we live in a world where Billy Wilder made so many great movies that it's hard and it's silly to try to even say which is his best. Um, but I think this is a nearly perfect film. Uh, if anybody's interested in learning about film noir especially, I think this is one of the premier examples of film noir, American film noir, that you can possibly see outside of the Maltese Falcon, perhaps. I think this is one of the really early noirs um, that kind of changed the way that people made uh, sort of crime movies, you know. Um, Barbara Stanwyck uh, is excellent. She's one of my favorite actresses of all time. I love her in everything she's done, but in this film, she is just so perfect. Um, she has a really sort of garish wig throughout most of the movie. <laughs> um, and that was a, a, an artistic choice by Billy Wilder. You know, he picked out the wig for her and everybody, the producers, even Barbara Stanwyck, I believe was kind of like, oh my God, this wig is ridiculous. This looks, you know, so silly. This is so cheesy looking and his response was yes I want her to look as fake on the outside as she is on the inside I want her to look garish I want her to look like a you know a, a clown in some way um, just totally false putting on some sort of pretense that everybody can see through yet she thinks makes her more powerful in some way um, so if you can get over the wig 
I've watched it with people and they didn't even notice it was a wig though, to be honest, so who knows. <laughs> but uh, it's obviously a wig, but anyway, her performance in this film is remarkable. I mean, this was, this was, you know, she had been an actress for a long time. She was already, I think, the highest paid actress in Hollywood at this time when they made this movie. But, um, you know, this movie was unique because this was right when The Hayes Code came out. And this movie is about a bunch of bad people doing bad things. There's no real, you know, maybe uh, Edward G. Robinson's keys is the moral center of the film, certainly. But, you know, whether it's Barbara Stanwyck or whether it's Fred McMurray, um, they're both just totally amoral characters with no redeeming qualities at the end of the day. Um, and so, you know, there's adultery, there's murder, there's, you know, all, all these things that the Hayes Code came in and made sure that people couldn't represent in certain ways, made it very difficult for artists and for directors to kind of tell stories that were outside of this sort of cookie cutter um, version of events that, you know, Hollywood became known for, this sort of saccharine uh, look at life, where Billy Wilder really kind of created something special here with Devil Indemnity because he was able to stay within that haze code, yet still make an incredibly subversive film that dealt with a lot of very heavy themes and again, two totally unredemptive main characters uh, running this film. And so it's it's a magic trick. It's great. It's beautiful. The photography is beautiful. Um, Fred McMurray's great. You know, I mean, a lot of people, <laughs> Fred McMurray was known as kind of this goofy, non-serious actor. You know, he was sitcom dad, all that sort of thing. Um, but he does such a great job in this, playing Walter Neff, the insurance uh, salesman who gets tangled up in this plot to murder Barbara, St Barbara Stanwyck's husband. Um, Barbara Stanwyck is, of course, sort of the archetype for the femme fatale here. She kind of sets the standard and it was never really bested after her, I believe. Um, you know, some scenes in this film, they're just, they stuck in my mind forever since I've ever saw them. The very first time you see her, when she's on the big uh, winding staircase at the top and her towel with the anklet and all that sort of things, just always stuck in my mind, just an incredibly powerful image. Um, the dialogue that, you know, um, Billy Wilder worked on with Raymond Chandler, uh, they, they didn't really get along well, to say the least, but they wrote a wonderful movie together. There's a lot of that hard-boiled sort of Raymond Chandler dialogue with Billy, Billy Wilder's ear for cinematic dialogue that's very zippy, and um, I think those two styles marry really well together. Um, one last thing I'll say about this movie is there's a shot where, um, the murder is being committed and I don't want to give away too much because if nobody's seen, I mean, it feels silly to say that there's spoilers for a movie made in the forties, but if nobody's seen it, go see it because it's a great story and there's twists and there's turns and it's, it'll hold your attention. But there's a scene while the murder is taking place and of course, you know, perhaps due to the Hayes Code, perhaps just due to a stroke of genius because Billy Wilder was a great, great director, instead of showing what's happening with the murder, they, he just holds a shot on Barbara Stanwyck's face um, in this very dark car at night with the lights across her face. And her acting there is incredible. Without saying a word, incredible. And that's, uh, I guess, one last, last thing I'll say about this movie, too, is that as far as photography goes, the cinematography in this, I think, especially for 1944 or whenever this was put out, I think it was 44, 1944, the cinematography does a lot of very interesting things with the black and white format. You know, color was starting to come out at this time, and they really pushed black and white in ways that you hadn't really seen in American films at the time. So there's a lot of scenes in this film that are very, 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 very dark. They take place in dark rooms with just little shafts of light streaming in. They take place in low lit rooms. Um, it's just really interesting to see an American film at this time play with light and shadow and darkness and the texture <clears throat> of black and white photography as well as uh, this film did. So. Devil Identity. Please watch it. And then let's see, we'll move on to the next film that I picked up uh, in the sale here. And this is a little more Halloween-ish, I guess, but David Cronenberg's Videodrome. Uh, love this movie, have loved this movie ever since I saw it when I was a teenager. It's incredibly fucking weird. I know that goes without saying when you're talking about Cronenberg, 
But if I had to choose my favorite Cronenberg film, it would probably be, if I had to make a real split decision, I would say it's either Dead Ringers or Videodrome. Um, and, you know, the one thing about this film is you got to put up with James Woods. He does not look like somebody who Deborah Harry would want to have sex with, but lo and behold, there he is. <laughs> he does a good job in the movie, but it's James Woods. It's just kind of weird. It's kind of weird to look at his face that long, I think. Uh, but in any event, you know, uh, one of the things I love about Cronenberg a lot is that, you know, he wrote and directed this as he writes and directs most of his films. Um, but, you know, they're made for such low budgets. They're essentially independent films made with a singular vision from one crazy Canadian. Um, and they're always incredibly inventive. You know, they don't they don't follow the sort of cliche horror movie beats, you know. I mean, this isn't necessarily a horror movie. I'd say this is sort of sci-fi, horror, erotica, s and M. I I I don't even know how to describe it. Body horror, of course. Um, but... Um, you know, Cronenberg always has, especially his earlier films, um, just such an incredible, uh, ingenuity that he always expressed and that he always, um, showcased with the way that he made films. Because again, he made these with very small budgets. He wrote and directed them himself, himself, and, um, they always had really interesting, especially for the time, special effects. And, you know, Rick Baker um, does the special effects in Videodrome. But there's a lot of really interesting stuff here, like the scene you see on the front with him putting his face into the TV is sort of one of the famous images. Um, but, you know, we get a lot of that body horror that Cronenberg loves to delve into, too. You know, James Woods gets the, the stomach vagina that he inserts things in and out of throughout the film. Um, you know, his hand becomes that weird phallic sort of molded gun almost like existens uh that he would do later on but um this movie is interesting because it's essentially you know at, at the period uh that this came out home video videotapes underground videotapes were really becoming this thing you know there's an underground video market there really was you know and there was always this um idea that there were snuff films out there that you could get, you know, snuff films being films where people are murdered, real people are really murdered on film for entertainment, right? And so um, the, the sort of conceit of this film is that James Woods um, owns a television station. He has a guy that he has pirate, you know, transmission, satellite transmissions for him to try to find new shows from all over the world that are weird and kind of things that he can put on his channel that nobody's seen before. And he intercepts a transmission known as Videodrome. And what Videodrome turns out to be is way more interesting than just a snuff film, although that's what it looks like. When they show you the shots of Videodrome, it's basically a, it looks like, you know, something from Hostel. It's a dark red room with grates in the floor that you can, you know, sweep liquid into. There's a big clay wall in the back that's electrified, and there's just places to chain people up throughout. And so I don't want to say any more because there's a really interesting twist here that's that's political, it's social, it's very smart, it's very creepy and fucked up, um, like only Cronenberg can do. But you know, essentially, um, they found a way to to weaponize snuff and pornography and things that they think that only the dregs of society are watching. And again, this is sci-fi it's horror it's body horror it's david cronenberg james woods deborah harry who how can you not love deborah harry um you know i mean huge huge fan of her music career always had a crush on her as a kid and when i saw her in this movie uh when i was young it kind of blew my mind that you know rock stars outside of david bowie <laughs> would be in weird subversive films so um go check out videodrome it's a great one to watch in the Halloween season, especially if you haven't seen it before. It's one that you just won't see what's coming next and you'll be constantly surprised. It's visually inventive. There's a lot of good special effects and the story is just very unique and very creepy. Next, we're gonna go to Orson Welles' The Trial from 1962. This is my favorite Orson Welles movie. Um, I know, you know, Citizen Kane, of course, everybody says that all the time. There's an argument to be made there or uh, Touch of Evil, Magnificent Ambersons. He's got a lot of great movies, but I'm a big reader of Kafka. I've always loved Kafka, um, and this is an adaptation of a Kafka book, The Process, The Process, The Trial. Um, Anthony Perkins plays Joseph K., the 
um, Kafka-esque everyman. <laughs> and he does an incredible job. I've always thought Anthony Perkins was an incredibly underrated actor. Of course, he was great in Psycho. But, you know, I mean, even the weird sequels to Psycho are actually pretty decent in some ways. And he always does a great job in them, you know, and his work with, with Ken Russell was great. I mean, he's just a really good actor. Um, and I think the trial really shows this off because he understood the character, he understood the story, and he played it really, really well. Uh, probably the best adaptation of Kafka I've ever seen. Uh, maybe Haneke's The Castle is close, but The Trial is definitely a film. If you're interested in literature, if you're interested in, in, in absurdity or surrealist cinema, even though this isn't necessarily surrealist, but um, very visually striking throughout, a lot of incredible photography, a lot of really interesting set uh, sets, set design, set pieces, things like that. Um, and it just tells the story about, you know, a bureaucrat being trapped uh, or, you know, a salary man being trapped in the bureaucracy of, of uh, culture and working and trying to figure out, you know, how to, um, <laughs> you know, he's accosted by the law and the law won't, won't let him uh, live his life without torment. Um, so it's just, there's a lot of existential dread. Again, this is kind of drifting off into something that Robert Smith might sing about perhaps, <laughs> but, um, very interesting story. Um, Jean Moreau's in this as well. Orson Welles is in it too. Um, uh, just great film to watch again, black and white cinematography, crazy, weird, absurdist story that's full of existentialist dread, great performances throughout. Go watch the trial. And then the last one I picked up on the flash sale was Nicholas Rogue's Don't Look Now, which I haven't even opened yet. I haven't watched because I just watched this like a few months ago. Um, so I haven't put it back into the rotation again yet. Julie Christie, Donald Sutherland, and Nicholas Rogue together um, in the 70s. You know what you're going to get. You know, if you know Nicholas Rogue, you know what this film is going to be like. There's just an enormously interesting texture to the photography. That 70s film stock, the grain, the color, uh, everything about it just looks comfortable and warm and I want to crawl inside of it and fucking die. Uh, but it tells a really interesting story. This is technically, I guess, a horror movie or a thriller, I guess you would say. Uh, most people call it that. Uh, but it's about some parents who have a child who dies because of their negligence. And they kind of, you know, fall apart and they start thinking they see their dead daughter, you know, here and there. Um, and it just kind of spirals out from that. But really, it's a story about a couple trying to process their shared trauma, you know, a, a couple that's married trying to work out, you know, their love for one another and their hatred for one another around the, you know, idea that they let their child die, um, their hatred for themselves, their hatred for one another. But, you know, there's there's a deep love there and they're trying to process this. They're trying to come back together and figure out how to move forward. Uh, when your world is sort of violated and changed like that. And so it's sort of, you know, Nicholas Rogue, 1970s again. It's a, <laughs> you know what you're going to get. It's sort of a 70s slow burn existential drama. You know, there's a lot of existentialism in here, I just realized. I don't know why that keeps coming up today, but um, <clears throat> it's, it's, it's a very interesting story um, that's just kind of disturbing in a slow, haunting way, you know, um, there's a really famous sex scene in this film that goes on between Donald Sutherland and Julie Christie that's just very drawn out, very realistic, non-Hollywood sexualized sexuality um, that might necessarily be one of the best sex scenes that's ever been put on film as far as realism, eroticism, and you know the emotional charge between the two characters that's helping to tell the story that we're watching here. Um, Don't Look Now is very interesting. Um, you should go watch it if you're interested in weird, slow burn horror movies from the 70s. Donald Sutherland's great. Julie Christie's great. Um, photography's great, of course. And Nicholas Rogue just, he has this specific style that I've just, it has always really resonated with me and I've always really responded to it. So you should go check out some of his other films as well. Uh, he did make one with David Bowie called The Man Who Fell to Earth, which is really good. And it's very in the same similar style. 
uh, Bad Timing is another one, which actually that's kind of strange because that has um, Art Garfunkel in it too. So it's like David Bowie, who worked with a lot of rock stars. You know, I, well, I hasten to call Art Garfunkel a rock star, but you know what I mean, musicians. Um, but Nicholas Rogue had a great catalog of films. Uh, this is one that's always been a highlight for me. And again, I think this might be a good one for sort of the Halloween spooky season. So go check this out too. You know what I'm gonna throw in for the first time ever here is I'm gonna throw in, in the spirit of the spooky Halloween season, a horror video game. That's right, we're gonna talk about Resident Evil. So this is one of my favorite PlayStation 1 games of all time. I'm gonna tell you the real quick story how I came to know Resident Evil. Uh, when this came out, which is what year? 1996? I was working in a video store at the time. Um, it was called Hollywood Video. I don't know if you remember that chain, but it was like a blockbuster except way cooler. Um, anyway, so I worked at Hollywood Video and, um, you know, back then video stores not only had a shit ton of movies you could rent, but they also always had a great video game section. And so, um, when games would come in, you know, us being workers there, we'd always get to kind of check them out, rent them, do whatever we wanted before the general public had a chance to. And uh, back then they also used to always rent video game systems. And so I was always a Nintendo kid growing up. Um, I mean, I had a Genesis, but I was NES, SNES. Um, I, you know, was starting to get into N64. I can't remember when that launched compared to this, but it was right around the same time. But at that period in time, Sony and their PlayStation was a totally new thing that there was no precedent set for. Nobody knew anything about Sony in the video game market at all. I knew Sony from electronics, of course, and televisions. I've always loved their TVs. Um, but, you know, video game market, weird. There was a lot of strange sort of CD-ROM based systems coming out around that time, like the 3DO and uh, the Jaguar, I think, was CD based. I don't know. But there, there was the Philips CDI, that was another one I remember. <laughs> but there were these, a lot of these weird sort of CD based systems coming out at that time. And a lot of them seemed to rely on the idea of full motion video, where, you know, this was a new thing at the time because of the CD format, they could put really shitty, compressed, grainy, real life, full motion video uh, onto game discs. And so they could kind of integrate that with like an opening cut scene or, you know, whatever uh, you may think about it or whatever they would use it for. That's kind of uh, what drew people to those systems at the time. However, I had already rented stuff like the Philips CDI um, and, you know, other CD based systems. And I was never impressed because the games were always shit. So I was not excited about the PlayStation at all. But since we could rent PlayStations, this, the hardware, you know, the, the PlayStation itself, and the games, uh, I picked up the PlayStation when we got it in and um, played, you know, one or two games. It was interesting and didn't think really anything of it. It wasn't like totally mind blowing to me at the time. But uh, then I saw this on the shelf and this was the original way it came out in this big long box format. This is still the copy I have from back then. Um, this is what PlayStation games used to look like before they started coming in CD cases, but um, I saw this on the shelf and I loved that cover so much that I was like, I don't even know what this fucking game is. It's called Resident Evil. It's got a guy with a shotgun with a crazy look on his face. Talks about horror and zombies and creepy mansions on the back. I was like, this is right up my alley. So I, this was, I had no idea what it was. Of course, I knew who Capcom was because again, I grew up with NES and SNES and all that. So I of course knew if it was coming from Capcom, it had to be good. Checked it out and had no idea what to expect. You know, this wasn't when people were using the internet really. So it was like, I went in totally blind to this and it blew my fucking brains out of my head. I could not believe how cool this was. And when you go back and you play it now, there's a lot of really cheesy dialogue and acting and all that sort of thing in it. Stop it. Don't open that door. But Chris is. What is it? Maybe it's Chris. Now, Jill, can you go? I'm going with you. Chris is our old partner, you know. Okay. 
Let me handle this. But just the style of the game, it was these pre-rendered backgrounds of this really creepy mansion. You know, I, it was almost like a, a clue, like a fair play locked room mystery to me because you were in this one location and you just kind of had to explore it and it got bigger and bigger and you'd find secret passages and all this sort of thing. So it was like, had this whole creepy exploratory uh, mansion vibe that I just loved. Then you throw zombies and monsters and shotguns and all that sort of thing into the mix. And you get something like Resident Evil, which is an action game uh, that's geared toward solving puzzles and figuring out conspiracies and things like that. And just shooting zombies in the head along the way. So uh, right up my alley, the graphics for the time were very impressive because again, they use this pre-rendered uh, backdrop uh, which was unlike most things where it was either drawn in sprites or, you know, at this time they were starting it in the fully 3D polygonal worlds. Uh, but I had never really remembered seeing pre-rendered backgrounds before. I mean, I guess some games had done that in some ways, like maybe the Donkey Kong Country games, I can't remember if they used pre-rendered backgrounds or not. But um, suffice it to say at the time, it was very quite new to me. I really liked the style of it because it looked very cinematic. There were these set camera angles, um, so you didn't have to sort of wrestle with the camera like you had to in a lot of early 3D games. And, you know, again, you, you got to explore. You, you kind of unlocked a mystery, and you just went deeper and deeper and deeper into this conspiracy. You, you know, explored the mansion. You went into these other areas outside of the mansion, and it became this bigger and bigger and bigger story. Um, and it just you know, hit me at the right time, um, and I've just always loved it ever since then. So regardless of the cheesiness of the acting and all that sort of thing, it's been ported and it's been, you know, re-released a million times. So you can get it a bunch of different ways, but, you know, one of the best ways to play this is either, you know, the original, the director's cut, uh, which just, you know, added a couple sort of uh, quality of life improvements to it, I would say. You know, you could like quick turn and auto aim and things like that, I think. But um, they did make a remake on the GameCube at one point, just called Resident Evil, which has since become known as just remake, like Resident Evil make, remake. Um, and it's been ported to all the HD systems, so you can get it on anything at this point. But that's probably your best bet if you want to play it today to play the remake, the HD remastered remake. Um, because again, uh, the vi it, it took the idea of the visuals from the first one and made them even more beautiful. And I think that game stands up incredibly well today. And, you know, the, the original ones with the pre-rendered backgrounds and these really low poly 3D models on top of them looks kind of weird today because you have this really, really low, you know, quality character model walking around these, you know, I guess now they're dithered and sort of compressed backgrounds. But again, for the time, and if you play them on original hardware and on, you know, a PVM or on a CRT or something like I do, then um, they still hold up, you know, for the time period for sure. Um, but the remake definitely makes it something that modern gamers can engage with in a much easier way. So Resident Evil, great game, million sequels. They're all pretty good, but you know, Resident Evil, Resident Evil 2, Resident Evil 4, and then, you know, probably seven and eight are the best of the bunch out of all of them. So check Resident Evil out like you've never heard of it. I know everybody that's watching this video is like, what the fuck are you talking about? Everybody knows what Resident Evil is. And that's it. That's all I got for you today. Those are the picks of the week. Until we meet again, take care of yourselves. Don't kill each other. Stop dropping bombs. Stop voting for people to drop bombs. And I'll see you soon.